Hi, I'm Michelle Manu. I'm here at the Martial Arts History Museum. born in Chicago. Yeah. My father met my mother in Chicago, married there, had me, and then we moved to the Big Island shortly after I was born. Your, your mother is Scandinavian? Mm-hmm. Okay, and your father was? Oh, uh, already? <laughs> uh, Hawaiian, Filipino, Chinese, English. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, what was it like growing up in Hawaii? Uh, well, I only lived there up until about one year old, and okay. then we moved to Southern California, which I spent most of my life up until I was just turned 15, and then we moved to Chicago. So, born in Chicago, mm -hmm. moved to Hawaii for Correct. a year, Southern California, back to Chicago. Yes, and then back home here to Southern California. Um, I think, you know, in the 70s, it was interesting to be of different races, uh, ethnicities, I should say. and. So you're going to run into some issues no matter what, but um, I enjoyed it more so than living probably anywhere else. Uh, I felt there was a little bit more of a freedom in Southern California, possibly all of California, but being able to be mixed and not be put in a category. Not to say we didn't have our issues as this white, blonde, 5'10 Scandinavian woman with this really dark, black-eyed, you know, guy, um, and then these you know, five kids uh, that all came out looking so differently. So I'm grateful to have been raised on the mainland in specifically Southern California. I've been able to have the, the best education and the best job opportunities. And there's a lot going on here. So uh, I get to do a lot all the time and promote what I promote now. But growing up gave uh, a lot of opportunities to grow sports and acad academia. And so I'm grateful for that. Did you begin learning hula first or martial arts first? Hula. Um, hula first. Mm -hmm. I, I started with a halal when I was 11 after I got injured and was pushed off team for gymnastics. Um, and that was in Anaheim. Yeah, Auntie Rosalie is from what I understand, Kumu. Um, when I, you, you said that you were learning the, the more ancient style of hula, were you taught the martial applications at that time? Not at all. Didn't even know they were contained within. Your, your first martial arts was Kempo, correct? Correct. Uh, well, it was interesting times because it was very much considered a, a boy's activity or a guy's thing. And there weren't very many females uh, that were studying. And so there was a two-for-one special, <laughs> a little bit away from the, ho the house, but my mom decided that, she, you know, my, for me and my sister, we should probably go and try it. There were always some stories about my dad being a fighter, and I think she just thought he would accept that. Uh, my mom was always trying to please my dad. <laughs> But he didn't actually find that to be very pleasing, which of course gave me more pleasure in trying to do better in that. But we showed up and, you know, the, the gi comes out of the bag and then they, they wrapped the belt and then we got on the floor. And the whole time I was not really feeling it. I already had strong opinions at the age of nine. <laughs> I already knew I wanted to be the president of the United States. I wanted to have a Porsche and I wanted my black belt. So I already knew I wanted these things at nine years old. So I get on the floor and I'm like, well, if you, you know, just try it. And I think it was within the first 10 minutes, um, you know, some oddities, they're speaking in a different language and everyone's lining up. And so I'm like the last one to kind of catch up. And, and I just realized, like, I, I don't know what happened that was the, a life-changing day for me, that I realized this is not for boys, this is actually for me. And I felt comfortable in that gi and 
Um, I loved the movements. They just seemed to come naturally. So after Kempo um, did hula a little bit more um, in Anaheim, and I never made it off the ground. She was a very strict kumu, so I saw, you know, what, 14? 11 to 14 is when we did that. And it was my sister and I again, you know, the two oldest out of five. And um, I, I was on the floor. I could never get off the floor. So we're using the Ili Ili's, you know, the, the rock, the lava rocks, and, and the Ipu, the gourd, and, um, you know, the Uli Uli's, the feather gourds. But I never, so it's all the, you know, the upper half of the body is the woman. So it was always the woman and the kids that were moving. But I got to see these, like, you know, 17 and 21-year-olds, the, the big girls, the girls you want to be when you're 11. They're standing and they're moving. And I just thought, wow, that I want to get off the ground. So my parents were divorcing again, each other, for the fourth time. And uh, that never really happened the fourth time after before he passed. But it, turbulent is all I can say. Um, so moved us to Chicago. I was a class president. <laughs> I was um, you know, in the competition cheerleading squad. I was French club president. I did everything that I could to keep myself busy when I was younger. And so when we moved, I just turned 15 and, you know, removed from that, you know, all of these things I've worked towards all of these years to a totally different world, Chicago, the Midwest. Um, it was ironic. I seemed to find, I made friends with, um, I call them now my Hanai family. If you don't know what that means, it's an adopted family. It wasn't too long after that I moved there that I left the family home. And uh, while going to school, high school, <laughs> um, I had three jobs. I forged um, <laughs> my work permit. <laughs> and somehow, I, um, it was like the second day of high school, uh, which I hated so much, coming from a place that I loved. I had straight A's, and I was an honor student, and blah, 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 um, to a place where education wasn't really all that important or focused on. Um, you know, they have real seasons there that changes the psyche of individuals that, that live there. So being part of school wasn't necessarily popular. And so I ran into um, a Samoan, a Samoan Italian family. And it wasn't too long after where we became family. And they allowed me to move in with them. And I started dancing and I started touring with them and filled in for two other groups. Um, so I got to dance all over for all sorts of associations, museums, parties, you know, I mean, on the boats on Lake Michigan at art institutes. I mean, just the most fabulous places to the most dirtiest places. And luckily, only once I lost my skirt. <laughs> Nonetheless, it was a full house at the O'Hare Marriott Konakai room. So yeah, everyone that night got flashed more than they needed to see, but I learned from it. I secured my skirt better the next time and, you know, a parable for life. Learn as we go. So, You know, I think being a competition cheerleader, I always wanted to be on the field. And I knew that. And one day I woke up and it was, you know, there's just some things that knowingness, like I, I want to play football. So I got online and I looked and I noticed there was a team in Santa Monica and there was a team in Long Beach and of course San Diego. Um, and I just thought, well, Long Beach is the closest. So I called, they already had tryouts. They said, come on, we'll make an exception. If you're athletic, come on, come and try out. So I went out, it was rainy that night and I tried out after practice and I made the team and I wasn't starting that year but I had a lot to, I had a lot to learn um, and but I made the team <laughs> and so we played in Hawaii we played all over the nation at this time it was starting to get some recognition from you know Nike and so uh, I think the owner in the in the IWFL um, they wanted to have better access to coaches and so being at the same time as football season, we had less access. So they switched it. So I played a full full year of football my first year. And uh, so we went fall straight into spring. And I really enjoyed myself. First season, I was a tailback. No surprise there. <laughs> and uh, But, you know, bigger for a tailback. These women are like 115, 125 pounds, and they're, they've got motors in their heels. And 
you know, second year I was moved to defense, which is a much better place for me. So I got to play uh, end. And that was so great for the second and third seasons of my my football experience. We had a line, D-line of all Polynesians, so mixtures, which is pretty crazy. And um, and then my third year, I was moved, third and fourth year seasons, I was moved to a uh, blitzing outside linebacker, which was so for me. <laughs> Always causing havoc. So it was great. I really, I really enjoyed it and the caliber of the athletes. Um, it was an honor to share the field with those women. Um, really tough women pushing through injuries and pain and much like hula dancers, but this is like full contact. This is a lot of serious injuries. And, you know, as Nike kind of funded part of one of the seasons, Sports Illustrated followed us around uh, for a season. I wish I had copies of some of those photos, I mean, magical photos, wind blowing in our hair after we take off our helmets. I mean, almost you can't, you know, replicate that. But just, it was just such a great experience. I returned um, from Chicago after being front and center and working very hard to be head hula girl and um, head choreographer. That when I came home, um, you know, I'd had my daughter <laughs> um, while I was in Chicago, so the body wasn't exactly aesthetically the same <laughs> from when I first started, and that's just part of being a woman and birthing, you know, life. Um, so I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I'm in my, you know, early 20s now, just breached early 20s, and I've got all this stuff going on. Can I, you know, wear a skirt down to my pubic bone and be in front and center now in a place where Polynesians aren't so uh, scarce? And probably the answer would have been no. We have so many amazing um, Polynesian dancers, not just Hawaiian, but I mean the Tahitian and the Maori and the Samoan and the... Fiji, and we have that here, these these great halals that are professional that tour everywhere, and I thought, do you really want to be front and center? And the answer, my inner woman said, no, it's time to go back to the contact, and there was no internet at the time, so I flipped open the yellow pages and did a search in Orange County, and I visited a Hapkido school in Westminster. And I went, he, he was kind, but you could tell he wasn't really ready to, it was all men. He wasn't, it would have been, I would have disrupted everything. Um, and then I found Alohe Solomon Kayivalu, and I thought, well, this, that's Hawaiian. So I picked up the phone and I called, and uh, everyone's heard the story, but I'll tell it again. Uh, a woman answers and you know sounds younger and I said hi my name is Michelle and you know I, uh, I really am interested in learning more about the art and I'd, I'd like to talk to uh, you know the master and she said he doesn't teach women and she hung she hung up and so I was like hello what oh no <laughs> so I, beep, 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 well, was it like this the rotary I can't even tell anymore so it's so long ago and um, she answers the phone and I, and I said, you know, I, I just called, I don't know what happened, but um, I'm interested in learning. I'd like to talk to the master about possibly becoming a student and training there. And I've been an athlete my whole life. I've taken martial arts uh, because during Chicago, I was training in Taekwondo and a little Hapkido there too, um, just to keep my stamina up. My, I was touring, so I mean, my it was 11 shows in one week was my I think my record and that's exhausting that's 45 to an hour on stage so it was helping me keep my cardio up and I explained this to her and uh, she said he doesn't teach women and she hung up and so I had it at that point so I called back and I said I think we got disconnected but that's okay because I'll just keep calling back and at that point she I talked a little bit more rapid fire she agreed to take my number and then and then he called and when he called, he talked for 20 minutes and he asked me about my family and, you know, what I'm about and, you know, digging deeper into the spirit and the soul of who I am, not if I know specific kicks. I think he was already sizing me up to see if I could even 
endure a day, a class with him. And so after that, he agreed to allow me to come and watch a class. And, um, and I did, I showed up in my work attire and hot little thing in the early twenties and <laughs> disrupted the class, but they performed perfectly. And, uh, you know, he even said so at the end. And I thought, this is it. This is the real deal. This is, he just closed his, do his last dojo. This was garage training and, um, about 12 to 15 guys there, not breathing. He walks in a room, they don't breathe. He hits them, he swears. It's old school, this, this was exactly like my upbringing. And I think, I didn't know it at the time, but it would have, I didn't know that that man would have healed so much of me through my training. So it's more than just physics, it, it, it's been life changing for me. So he brought me in the house and sign paperwork and, and I've been training since. Uh, the beautiful art of Kui e Lua, which is the ancient form, was started out more of a, a healing art. Um, you know, Olohes, which means hairless one, bare one, also wise one. Um, they were the war strategists for the military, and the the kings and rulers listened to them. They weren't just tactical; they were they looked at the full picture of the culture and what the war would do um, to the to the people and the society as a whole. Um, you know, fast forwarding uh, to Lua and the different styles today. Uh, after all the warfare. <laughs> and the genocide of the people in specific parts of the culture, whether the monarchy agreed to it because they were fascinated with the cannons and the different, you know, bayonets and things like that, regardless of whose fault it is. Um, it went underground and the Elohis then weren't considered necessary. Uh, everything then became about maximum kills. And that is where my Elohis era is from. So you'll see other Lua arts, which who I have much respect for, and I'm getting to know quite deeply these days. It's my honor entirely to have the support of other elders from different Lua arts. It's, it's unimaginable to me. But my Alohe uh, is third generation Alohe. His mother also knew Lua too. She was a royal and a li'i. My Elohi is a technician. He's more than just a war strategist. He is, I mean, a physician in so many ways with weight distribution and angles and, you know, cutting and not wasting of an animal. A land, you know, Lua is a land, sea, and animal, nature-based movement. So, you know, to describe this art, if you think of the ancient Kahiko, the hula, and then you turn that into... Uh, combat and contact and striking close quarters, that is the Lua. Coupled with warriorism, the real way of life, not just mangling maximum kills, killing everyone, and no consequences. Um, this art and the culture is connectedness to each and every living thing. I'm not just talking about humans. Um, and knowing that when we, and with poor intent, set out or not care and we hurt others, we are ultimately hurting ourselves. So in this warfare and uh, lua, you know, pit, uh, toilet, uh, burying your waste, your opponent in, in that, that deep, dark pit in a, in a circular manner, that is lua, that is toilet, that is what Elohi will say over and over again. You know, use the ground to bust your opponent. A Lua duality, light, dark, masculine, feminine. Everything has been so dominantly ku, masculine. And I really feel that, you know, I didn't know in my training that I would be representing the Hina in such a strong way. Not not to take over the ku, but to m match and to complement uh, the duality that all of the scholars and elders speak of in the culture. After that, then laws were written and passed to ban the Lua from public display and practice. And so therefore it went underground and was buried in the, in the darkest of night where the warriors would practice. And 
uh, it would went into the hula. And so um, a lot of hulas take gorgeous, of course, you know, and different from each island. Um, but they don't really know that they're doing techniques that were concealed that is actually lua. Um, I wish they knew what they were doing instead of it being a competition all the time, which of course we can revel in and appreciate. I mean, all hula dancers have tremendous pain because of the joints and the hours of practice and the life they dedicate. But there's more to it than that. Uh, the SHE program stands for Superhero Experience, and uh, it's gimmicky, but it works, taking mere mortal women um, dressed in their alter ego into their superhero power. And I think that women were not necessarily raised to know how powerful they are, or they don't feel it's okay to be the way that they've been made because of societal pressure or role models that were I don't know, are set before us and, and how we're supposed to dress, act, think, respond, not respond. And so this program developed itself. It, my late life coach actually named it. And it is just to know that we are superheroes internally, uh, whether we're in our alter ego outfit or not. <laughs> I mean, even Clark Kent needs to change, right? Jennifer, is it Walters? You know, She-Hulk, she needs to change as well, but she already starts becoming. We're that all the time. And I think that, um, you know, besides learning defense to rape or um, the crowbar, the hammer, the zip tie defense, the hair grab, uh, the front choke, all these things that are real life. Uh, you know, it's also knowing that they can and they should know that they're worth it. So there's visualizations that I do throughout the program. Uh, first is getting their mindset proper to where I have them close their eyes and hold who they love most dearest on this planet. And then I ask them to envision their loved one in a situation where they're being attacked or they're about to be attacked and they're able to rush in and, and save them. And this all goes on quietly while they sit there with their eyes closed and um, they rescue their loved ones, they pull them out, they're at home and they're, you know, they're sobbing together, but they're safe. And, um, you know, you can feel the breath kind of leave the room because this becomes very real. And then I ask them to switch the visual of their loved one to their own face. And I ask them to put themselves in the same situation. And we walk through that situation and the women's it's such an amazing response. Some women, you know, their eyes bolt open, they leave the room. Some, their jaws drop open. Some start rocking. Some start crying. Some lay down and they're quietly sobbing. You can just see their chest going because they realize this double standard of they would never do when they're not mentally prepared and spiritually prepared to... Um, defend themselves like they would who, of who they love, their loved ones. So there's a lot of that that goes on. We also go through a little bit of healing and of past events so that they can shed that energy that their body's keeping so they can move forward freer in this new superhero, <laughs> uh, I don't know, way of being. Heroes are the people, for me, that keep their word, that genuinely have great intent at all times, not just when people are looking or when they're posting something on social media. The people making a difference in other people's lives around the world in their own magical way, their own gifts and their own talents. We don't, there's no way we can be perfect or all the same. And that's the beauty of it. Nature is never the same. It fluctuates. So do the seasons in our life, the people in our lives, and our calling. It kind of chooses us. So those, those people that are open to that, that can let things go and not respond in the caveman and cavewoman emotionalism to every little thing, they're my heroes. 
my purpose right now is completely unfolding. But you know, Dr. Hawkins would say nothing's unfolding. That it's just our awareness catching up with that which already is. And I tend to believe that. Talking to the universe and saying, you know, okay, the universe walks up and you're at, you know, a diner. And Rob, Rob can appreciate this. The waitress, the, AKA universe, walks up and say, what do you have, what do you have, Michelle, today? What do you feel like having? It's choosing what our purpose is when it presents itself. Those opportunities come and I don't want to miss a thing. Every day I pray, use me. You've prepared me for this. Everything in my life has brought me to this place. And how amazing is that when I really sit and think about it. And there's so much more work to be done. There's so much more I need to catch on to. And it's not this false humility. It's knowing for a second. If I become this grandiose, oh, it's Michelle Manu, don't you know who I am? This will all be stripped from me. Every single breath of it all connectivity, all vision. And I just want to continue to be that spokesperson for the people to bring the fire of the Hina, you know, to match the, the coup, to say this is really what our culture has been about the whole time. Regardless of how women and the feminine have been erased, you know, over time, because, you know, scholars come in, they come with a certain perspective that doesn't have value for the feminine, but there is history written. We still have some books. We still have rulers and their names and their islands and their people. You know, what they ruled, how they ruled, you know. Gracious, fair, powerful, trusted, abundant, all those things. It's not that women weren't allowed to do certain things and sacrifices. That was the man's job. Women did all the things that men did. And they were, they were revered for it and they were respected for that. You know, birthing everything from Poe, from the physical or the spiritual into the physical. And likewise, the men didn't interfere. They wanted nothing to do with it. <laughs> they gave the women the right in their temple and you know, there was re that mutual respect. How do you want to be remembered? I'm not really sure how I want to be remembered, just as I am. I'm not looking for people to say certain things about me, but I do want to be remembered for being focused and intolerant to, to stuff that is not healthy, um, to be an advocate for the culture and for women. Just, I don't know, to say, you know what? She was a good person. If you could go back in time and visit the younger Michelle, and I don't know what younger means, you know, um, younger might mean some at some younger point. You pick that. What would you? What would you say? I think mine is not specific events. It would have been um, my essence. You know. I would have tried to not be so hard on myself the predator that I teach about, that voice that comes up. I'm not supposed to know everything. I'm not supposed to be perfect. You know, allowing people to actually support me without thinking that they're going to want something in return. Not everyone does. And just making those hard decisions without the fear of the response from the other person. You know, a lot of hard decisions made, but I... I would probably just want to, <laughs> depends on what it was, you know, whether it was raising my daughter, divorce, um, you know, working so hard, or my training. I'm glad I didn't quit. The voice said quit, and I'm glad I didn't. I would, I probably would have strengthened her even more. But for myself, I would have said, you know what, you're doing okay. Lighten up, breathe a bit. You're a good mom. You are a good wife. You're a good sister. You're a good friend. You, you know, you can't be everything to everyone. And that you should probably take some time for yourself. <laughs> I still struggle with that. I 
I would say find, find the best teacher for you. Um, so, you know, schools are different these days, teachings are different, um, even systems have changed um, from when we all started training. But, you know, where a teacher that meets you where you are right now, um, and to not quit, dedicate six months of your life to see if that's the right thing for you or the right art. Um, to not compare yourself against the person next to you, but use them as a marker. If, if they're a little bit better, they've been training a little bit longer. Study their movements, you know, it mimic them, train harder, smarter, always be safe. It's not about busting someone in the mouth or breaking someone's bones. It really is movement. So we learn more about who we are in every sense and in, in all of our layers, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. And show gratitude, realize we are always a white belt, regardless of our promotions, that they're, we're always learning something all the time from all of those around us, not just our, our teacher, you know, students. And um, I think that's what I would have to say. Yeah. That's what you tell your students now. Yes. I want to um, thank you for coming out and um, the interviews that I do are you know, they're supposedly for your guys and for the museum, but they're really for me because mm. I get so much out of the, uh, uh, about learning about people and, you know, you making yourself accessible to me and somewhat, somewhat vulnerable. Yeah. And I always walk away <laughs> from every interview that I've done um, like this, a little bit wiser and a little bit more enlightened, mm. I think, uh, little bit more empowered and I believe I come out of the interviews being a better person mm. or at least having the potential to be a better person in some way but somehow I've been improved and then that just resonates out in my yeah. beingness with you know, people that I uh, encounter so you honor me by, um, by your presence today and by you know being so straightforward and I, I, thank, thank you so you. much for that and that being said okay Oh, pal. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Well done.